My name is Mary Kelly Quinn from University College Dublin. And in this session, we will have four short presentations. So I'm going to open by setting the scene and outlining the need for action. Uh, following that, Marie Archbold from the EPA will look at, or at least present some information on the national approach. Uh, Caroline Crowley from Norvision will deal with community action. And finally then, John Foley from the Carry Life Project will present the actions of an individual. So the focus of this session is on aquatic um, biodiversity. And at the end of the session, when we've all spoken, I am going to open up the session then for discussion. I will present a, a slide with some questions that I want to pose and that the team wants to pose. But please also use the system that's in place here for posing uh, your questions. So let's make a start, if I can manage to operate this thing here. Okay, so as I said, I'm gonna start by setting the scene. And there is no doubt that there is growing concern that globally aquatic biodiversity, which makes up about 10% of all known animal and plants on the earth, that it's declining. And it's declining at a faster rate than on land or in the sea. So for example, and there was reference to the Living um, Planet report, the Freshwater Living Planet Index highlights about 83% decline since the 1970s. And in addition to that, there has been a recent paper which is highlighting the demise of insects worldwide and in that paper, it highlights three, or sorry, four aquatic insect groups that are threatened. Mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, dragon, and damselflies. One of the problems for aquatic biodiversity is that it's largely out of sight and therefore out of mind. And it's very difficult for people to make the connection between the aquatic biodiversity and the goods and services that we derive from fresh waters and the quality of those services. So my question here is, how does Ireland's freshwater biodiversity fare? And to answer that question, we need information. We need to know what species we have or should have, how they're distributed, what are their habitat, requirements and what are the threats to those species. So that's largely what I'm going to cover. So first of all, what do we know? Well, I think we have a good handle on our fish and macroinvertebrate. We know the species, we, we have a fair idea of how they're distributed. But there are considerable knowledge gaps relating to macroinvertebrates, periphyton, and zooplankton. So taking macroinvertebrates as an example, we have about, and note I'm saying about, 2,400 species. Some groups are very well known, for example, the mayflies, the caddisflies, and the stoneflies, and we're highly unlikely to record any new species. But there are other groups where the numbers of species are increasing, or at least are being, new species are being recorded on an annual basis. For example, the, the flies, the diptera. There's a considerable amount that we don't know. We don't have definitive checklists for all of the aquatic groups. And the distribution of most species is poorly documented. Some larval stages, especially the diptera or the flies that have some weird and wonderful creatures are not easily identified and the keys are not great either. The functional role of many of these species is also poorly understood and few groups have been red listed. Red listing is an assessment that determines the likelihood of those species becoming extinct. So in terms of red listing, we have red listed those five groups that are on the slide there. 
And you'll notice the, the figures that I have in bold are highlighting that there are substantial threats to some of those species. But what I also want to point out is that those, the red listing of those species, for most of them, it was done on data that was collected over 10 years ago. I worked on the mayfly red listing and the data I used was collected 20 years ago. So we really don't know what species are currently threatened. And I know from my own experience, I would say the, the number of threatened species of mayfly species is much higher than the figure that I have on the slide there. There's also a number of factors that we have to take into account when we're planning conservation action, and these factors will also uh, uh, influence the likely success of our actions. So again, taking macroinvertebrates as an example, most species have a patchy distribution. So if you take river invertebrates, there are less than 10 species that I could be sure that would occur in most Irish rivers. In fact, about 50% of riverine species occur in less than 5% of river sites. So no one river site, or indeed no one river reach, or no one river catchment will support all species. Another interesting fact is that almost 30% of a catchment's macroinvertebrate biodiversity is unique to the headwaters. And again, all of those species will not occur in every headwater branch. It's the network that matters. So we need to protect as many branches as possible. High status sites are obviously a priority for protection and restoration. And there has been a dramatic decline in the number of high status sites that we have in the country. There's no doubt that high status sites will support a higher biodiversity than good status sites, but I honestly cannot tell you what is the species loss that we have if we, if we decline from high to good status. But I can tell you that if we go from good to moderate status, we can lose up to 40% of species. Now here again, we need to think about multiple catchments. Uh, way back in 2004, we, um, my group did a study on high status sites and we had 50 high status sites to work on. And those 50 sites recorded 90% of stoneflies, but just 67% of mayflies and fewer of the caddisflies. So I think we need very large numbers of high status sites if we are going to protect our biodiversity complement. Some river catchments and some areas in the country are particularly species rich, and I could really think about them as hotspots for aquatic biodiversity. Uh, for example, the Killarney area and also the Sleeve Bloom area. And they sit strategically, they're strategically important in terms of rehabilitation of rivers that are recovering from pollution. These are areas of, of source populations that can recolonize rivers that have, where pollution pressure has been reduced. They really are a priority for protection. If we don't have these source populations, we will not restore rivers to good ecological status. So, I want to finish off with a piece that is taken from the Living Planet uh, report, and the minister also referred to part of this this morning. And it states that we're the first generation that has a clear picture of the value of nature and our impact on it. We may be the last that can do something about it. We all have a role to play in reversing the losses in nature, but time is running out. From now until 2020 will be a decisive moment 
in history. I think we're at a tipping point and we have to take action. And that action must come from governments, businesses and citizens to rethink how we can produce, consume, measure success and value the natural environment. So with that, I want to hand you over to Marie Archbold from the EPA. Okay, thank you very much, Mary. Um, I'm from the EPA catchments unit within the EPA, and I'll be giving an overview of our role in managing river catchments for biodiversity. And I just uh, want to thank my colleagues for the contribution uh, to my presentation here today, and also thank the conference organisation, uh, the conference organisers, for the invite to speak here today as well. Um, okay. Okay, so under the Water Framework Directive, the goal is to protect and restore our aquatic ecosystems. And our role within the, the catchments unit is uh, outlined in the bullet points, but for the purpose of today's presentation, I'm just going to focus in on talking about characterization and about technical implementation of measures. So in terms of, well, what is characterization? Well, under the Water Framework Directive, it's essentially identifying is there a problem uh, in our uh, aquatic ecosystems. And if there is, it's about figuring out what is causing it, where it's happening exactly, and why it's happening. And then, ultimately, it's about how we fixed it, how we can fix it. So for the second cycle of the River Basin Management Plan, uh, we undertook this work. Sorry, this is... Uh, and we, uh, that, was, that was all reported in the second cycle of the River Basin Management Plan, which was published in uh, April 2018. And we're now beginning the third cycle, uh, preparing that, uh, starting that assessment again. Um, okay. So in terms of then identifying, uh, is there a problem and where is action needed? Where is action required? We first start with, uh, looking at in the, the top graph uh, up there uh, um, on your left, your top left, we start by looking at ecological status and we take that as our foundation stone in terms of, uh, our foundation uh, stone in terms of assessing if, uh, if there's an issue. Uh, so you can see in this graph that we have our water bodies listed, uh, our types of water bodies listed down, going down from rivers down to groundwater. And also the colours indicate the, the percentage that are achieving each status type. So the example blue is high status, green is good, uh, yellow is moderate, poor is the orange and bad is red. So clearly already, if you, think, if you take into consideration that the objectives of the Water Framework Directive is that we must achieve at least good status in all, in all our water bodies. So clearly, if you look to the right and look to the right of that black line, you can see that in a number of water bodies, and in particular in our rivers, lakes and estuary, we're a long way off achieving that goal at the moment. So there's a lot of action required. But again, this is not enough just to, to indicate if there's a problem. We need, this session is about thinking into the future. And that's what we do in terms of characterization as well. We progress, we project into the future using uh, trend, um, trend uh, information. So it's, for example, if we've data uh, for on ammonia or phosphorus, we project that into the future and we look, if there's an increasing trend, we look to see if that's going to fall below certain EQS standards by the end of each river basin management plan cycle. So those um, uh, pieces of information then go to uh, inform if a water body is at risk of not meeting its, its uh, water framework directive environmental uh, objective. So as you can see here in this uh, map uh, of Ireland, you can see that we have a, a, a large number of red uh, areas, and these are, these are the water bodies that are at risk of not achieving uh, their environmental ob objective. So we've over 1,400 of these water bodies, and, clear, and these are where we need to target action in. So in terms of, we know where the 
problem is where we need to improve or where we need to take action. So the next thing is to figure out what's causing the problem. So what we do and what we have done, we, for the second cycle, we integ integrated over 140 different data sets. And just to summarize up these data sets, we had data sets on our point sources, on our diffuse sources, which include information on agriculture, on forestry, uh, for example. Then we also looked at that in the context of their location in the catchment setting, taking into consideration the soil type, the subsoil types, the bedrock types, and linking all this information together along that source pathway receptor framework. We also developed uh, and adapted a suite of uh, apologies, a suite of tools, uh, and one of our tools was the pollution impact potential maps, which are essentially critical source areas that mark the hot spot areas for nutrients that impact on our surface water mm -hmm. in our catchments. Also, we use tools such as source uh, apportionment models and tools. And these allow us to look at the di what contributes the largest uh, loading of nutrients in our uh, catchments. So for example, is it wastewater treatment plants? Is it agriculture? Is it forestry? And then if we're able to identify what the dominant, where the dominant loadings are coming from, we're then able to work into targeting into those areas to see where the, the measures are potentially required. All of this information was then discussed with all our stakeholders as numerous uh, local authority and in, uh, regional workshops. And also we took in a large amount of information from the likes of Irish Water, from uh, our local authorities and from IFI in particular, to, to name a few. And all the data that we assessed for the second cycle was up until the end of uh, 2015. So the outcome then was, well, we identified, you know, the significant pressures on the, the categories you can see there in the graph. Um, so agriculture was the dominant significant pressure with well over uh, 700 of our water bodies impacted. Uh, then we were followed by wastewater uh, and this, in this graph uh, here we have a summary of wastewater which combines both domestic and urban wastewater. But if you think urban wastewater is approximately two thirds and domestic is uh, one third. Um, then we were followed by hydromorphology, forestry, other diffuse urban, peat, industry and mines and quarries. Now, uh, other uh, contains a, a number of different uh, pressures, including invasive species, abstractions, where we weren't certain of the impacts as well, uh, they were classified as anthropogenic impact, uh, impacts from waste, impacts from contaminated land. So you can see here on the two maps, we have a map, the top map shows where uh, we have, we are able to spatially show where uh, our water bodies are imp impacted by, where uh, uh, urban waste water is a significant pressure. And then on the bottom uh, uh, map, it shows where agriculture, the water bodies where agriculture is a significant pressure. It's also important to note that um, over half, we have 1,000 over uh, 1,400 of our water bodies uh, are at risk, but over half of these water bodies have multiple pressures. So that makes it much more difficult to assess in terms of figuring out what's causing the problem, but also it makes it more difficult to target measures in the right place as well. Okay. So in terms of fixing the problem then, what do we do? Well, we have basic measures and basic measures have been there as far back as the start of the first cycle. They're essential, but they're clearly not doing enough. And you saw Mary uh, talking about the declines earlier. Uh, so we still need them, but we need more. We need supplementary uh, targeted measures that target the right measure in the right place. Now, under uh, the River Basin Management Plan, there was uh, 726 of the at-risk water bodies, uh, primarily at-risk water bodies, that were targeted for action in uh, areas for, for action. You see it here in this graph, uh, uh, this map in the middle of the screen. Uh, and the local authority waters program will be going out to undertake assessment in these, uh, in these water bodies uh, to assess what type of measures are needed. 
where there are significant, where agriculture is identified as a significant pressure, um, the ASAP, who are made up of Chagas advisors and advisors from the dairy co-ops, will be going out to work with farmers to put to advise on what measures are appropriate and will help mitigate and improve our uh, aquatic uh, ecosystem and our aquatic biodiversity. Um, also, an action on the River Basin Management Plan was the, the, uh, to begin the Blue Dot Programme, which is focused on protecting and restoring our high status objective water bodies, which are here on the map on the right. But what, what we need to really, what we need to make it to, to, uh, nationally, what we need <coughs> is a suite of practical measures to help in this work. And not only that, but we need those measures um, to not just look at improving aquatic uh, biodiversity, but also measures where we can get multiple benefits. So what do I mean by uh, multiple benefits? Well, mitigation actions are measures with multiple benefits, are measures that can help one or more of the following, can help uh, the aquatic biodiversity, the terrestrial biodiversity, can uh, help in terms of climate uh, mitigation, flood relief, well-being, for, uh, for example. So I'll just give you an example of the type of measure that could be a, a multiple benefit. So here we have a, a bird cover at the top of a field. And if you look, stand with your back uh, to the bird cover and look down the field, you can see that there's a slope going down to a stream at the bottom of that field. If you go down to the bottom of that street, uh, field, you can see the stream is running alongside this hedgerow here on the other side of the fence. But also, uh, you can see it's visible that there's poaching there and there's water ponding. And you actually can see some water flow pathway going into the stream there as well. And that, with that pathway, it's likely that that overland flow pathway will be carrying phosphorus and or sediment into the, into the stream, which will have impact on water quality and our uh, 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 aquatic uh, biodiversity. So instead of having the bird cover, <coughs> sorry, uh, the bird cover at the to top of the field, we place it, uh, it would make more sense if it was targeted at the, at the bottom of the field, so that essentially to create a buffer strip or a riparian. And this would in turn allow the pathway to be broken, that overland flow pathway to be broken, which would help improve the, the water quality and the aquatic biodiversity in that stream. And also, it would give us the further multiple benefits that I was talking about in terms of benefits in terms of terrestrial biodiversity for climate and potentially for flood relief as well as just some examples. So going forward then in terms of improving aquatic biodiversity and water quality, well, um, it's about targeting the right measure in the right place. I think that's the first uh, point. And then it's also about talking to one another and working with one another to identify, help identify where we can get the best bang for buck in terms of targeting the right measure in the right place. But also, it makes more sense if we can put in measures that have the multiple benefits that will benefit a number of different areas rather than just focusing on the uh, aquatic biodiversity as well. Obviously, like John Fitzgerald said uh, earlier in the plenary, um, no one's going to do this if it's going to cost them money. And I suppose that's where really incentives are needed to fund these new type of measures that we're going to require to actually get these improvements. And also, I think um, going forward as well, nationally, we're going to need to start thinking you know, at a catchment scale in terms of working with one another across our different agencies and with the public, managing our catchments, uh, and also planning, you know, going forward in terms of planning at a catchment scale. And I suppose going forward, it's, you know, we have to think, we use the kind of the, the phrase, target the right measure in the right place. But maybe it's a, a case of going forward, it's targeting, uh, you know, the right land use in the right place going forward. So just um, in terms of 
Again, we're going to need to collaborate closely with one another across all the various agencies and different groups. And we would call, we have a catchments newsletter that we coordinate uh, uh, within the catchments unit. So we would call for any articles on your learnings, things that have improved or maybe not worked as well, for you to submit articles to the catchments unit uh, or to the catchments newsletter at uh, our email uh, address there. And also for previous uh, editions of that catchments newsletter, you can find them on catchments.ie. Um, and then I'll just finish by quoting our catchments unit motto, uh, by working together we will achieve more. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marie. Uh, I think Marie's last slide brings us very nicely on to our next presentation from Caroline Crowley, who's going to be talking about community action at the catchment level. Thank you very much, Mary. I'm going to uh, be picking up from Mary and Marie on a few points. Um, it's great to be here today to be able to talk about the NOR vision and I'm really interested in the discussion we have afterwards. Um, specifically what I'm going to be picking up from Mary is, Mary was talking about it's the network that matters, the network of the river system. It's joined up and Mary also said we need to protect as many branches as possible which is something that we're, we're, we're aiming to do in the NOR vision. And then uh, Marie was talking about this idea of multiple benefits, that we need to be thinking beyond our silos, working together so that we can actually align many of our goals. The, the solutions are much broader than our own particular disciplines. So that that's really rings true with us and for this to happen at the catchment scale. So the NOR catchment, it's in the southeast of the country. The uh, blown up map there shows you that the yellow portion is the, the part of the catchment of the NOR that's in Kilkenny. The white is in County Leash and the blue areas are headwaters in northern and southern Tipperary. So this is a river system, a catchment that spans two and a half thousand square kilometres. It has a population of 150,000 people going all the way from Kilkenny City to the most um, you know, remote, uh, remotely populated rural areas, right through towns and villages. So a very diverse place. And you have different jurisdictions, different county councils, um, none of them working at the catchment level. Um, so it's a, an interesting project to work on. Sorry, I have it upside down. That's why it wasn't working. <laughs> So the Norvision, what is it? The Norvision started off, it was an initiated by Kilkenny Leader Partnership. And basically Kilkenny Leader, they have a, a county jurisdiction within Kilkenny to the rural development and social inclusion. And they knew this River Nor was important and they wanted to encourage communities in Kilkenny to turn towards the Nor. They started it off, this initiative to encourage collaborative coordinated action around a shared understanding of a desirable future. The question was, what future do we want in Kilkenny for the Nor? But then as we began to understand the geography of the river and we learned about catchments, we suddenly realized that headwaters are in northern southern Tipperary, a little bit over in Green in County Carlow, and of course the Schlieve Blue Mountains up in County Leash, which is uh, a blue dot water body area. So suddenly we start to realize that for people living in Kilkenny, industries like Glanbia and everybody else in between and the County Council, what's happening upstream is outside of the jurisdiction of Kilkenny County Council So and Kilkenny Leader Partnership in terms of its work. So suddenly it became a much bigger project and became much more uh, partnership, um, you know, much broader in its, its remit. As Marie was saying, the EPA is showing us that there's evidence of different pressures. So what we were emphasizing from the beginning in this project was concepts of collective responsibility and cooperation. There was clearly an understanding from the very beginning that this was much bigger than any single agency, any single county, any single NGO or organization or community. And the communities were all joined up by the river. The partnership approach was 
um, reflected in the establishment of a steering group from the beginning, different agencies, county councils were, were brought in as time went on and various leader companies were brought in, again as, our, uh, as we understood the catchment geography. And that idea of collective responsibility that we spoke um, to people that we consulted with in our workshops, it was very much flagged in different maps we drew of the catchment, just drawing on publicly available data, showing what kind of land uses were across the catchment. The green, that light green is, is pasture, improved pasture. So it's, it's a very strong agricultural area, as we know, it's a very strong uh, intensive dairying area as well as tillage. But we also just popped in where the, EP, uh, the industries that are licensed by the EPA are, uh, little symbols there, because we were trying to flag it's beyond agriculture alone, there's industry, there's where we have our, our waste facilities as well. Um, where people live in the Nor catchment, what we also said was if you live in the Nor catchment, if you flush the toilet, if you brush your teeth, if you wash dishes, if you drink water, you are part of what is happening to the river system in terms of what's being discharged as well as what water is being abstracted from it. So this idea of collective responsibility was flagged by mapping population density from the last census. Every dot is, represents 15 people. And then, of course, we showed in the data from the EPA that was available at the time, showing that ecological status of surface waters around the catchment. And you could see very different colours. The blue, the only blue area up in the Schlieve Bloom Mountains at the top of the map up in County Leash. And then you see um, headwaters, a lot of headwaters were sh showing uh, green, which is good status. And then you start to see quite a mix happening as you move down um, and as the water is collecting, uh, having passed through a lot of communities. So really emphasising to the communities and, and to the counties that it's, it's joined up and what's happening upstream is going to impact on downstream. We had our consultations, and I'm not going to spend time on this, uh, but it's, uh, we had really good consultations across the catchment, various agencies and communities and, and organisations. And out of that, out of all of these contributions where we asked people, what are your interests and concerns in the NOR? And now, what is your vision for the future? And how, what steps are needed to, to get there? And all of that was condensed into five themes. So uh, three kind of thematic themes, if you like, sectoral themes, and then two cross-cutting ones. At the heart of it, water quality came up again and again. And uh, aquatic biodiversity is tied in with this particular one. And then natural heritage and floodplains, the green one, that's really about land management, joining up land management at the landscape level. And then, of course, that idea of you need to identify what it is that people are interested in. You need a hook for not everybody's interested in those themes. And a major hook in, in any community in Ireland is cultural heritage as well as recreation. So an awful lot of people engage with landscapes, engage with the environment through their, their user interests. The cross-cutting themes came up again and again at the top. Um, governance, planning, management. How do we join up? thinking and action at a catchment scale. Um, it's not happening right now. And we have very good people. And we need to have now very good uh, cultures in our organizations that really lend themselves to working in a much more joined up way. And then at the community level, education, engagement, and empowerment. So again and again, educators were telling us we can't get our school children to, to the rivers. You can't even see because the, the river vegetation is so grown up. Communities were saying, engage with us, but they were also saying, empower us, because as community groups, we are coming up with wonderful ideas again and again, and we feel like we're not being supported, we're not getting funding, and the bureaucracy is overwhelming. And we've heard that in, in a previous session. So where does that lead us to? In terms of just a quick look at some of the comments that were coming out around biodiversity, have clear running water in the River Nore with plenty of healthy fish and crustaceans. Other people talked about species recovery and they emphasized what kind through enhancement of habitat and restocking. Forestry was also there, diversified forestry. And so people were linking what was happening in the river to what was happening on the land. Young people, this, this came up again and again. We as human beings need to have the opportunity to develop relationships with our rivers. 
um, with our environmental resources. So enabling access to the rivers was a, a big thing that came out again for, for all of the family, for young people especially. And that's where, going back to what Marie was talking about and what John will be talking about next, that idea of um, multiple benefits when you're looking at landowner schemes, so moving that bird cover down by the river stream, but maybe, just maybe, you incorporate access, a trail through that buffer. So, and again, you're, you are rewarding the landowner for allowing access. I'm very sorry, for allowing access. That was just to wake you up. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm going to leave these slides. You can have a look at them, but this is how we just encapsulated very broad visions um, for two of those themes that mm -hmm. apply to what we're talking about today, aquatic biodiversity. And I want to leave you with where we're, what stage we're at now in stage two. So the leader companies, there's four of them involved in this project um, are coming together to apply for funding for a cooperation project across the entire catchment, um, identifying willing coll collaborators, and, and we have um, those already, linking with the Norvision themes, what came out of the consultations, um, actions that are going to deliver some of those uh, visions that people had for the NOR, and then of course indicators so we can really see what's going on. But the whole tagline for the second stage is joined up thinking and action. We have heard that call over and over again, and that's what we're going to be working to. But the last point I want to leave you with is everything that we're talking about today crosses disciplinary boundaries as well as territorial boundaries. And this, um, the emphasis here is the need to move away from our comfort zones within our disciplines, within our expertise, within our particular territories, and work across those boundaries. It is incredibly challenging, and it seems to be one of the biggest challenges we're facing in the Norvision right now, trying to figure that out, trying to learn from models like the Rivers Trust. So I'm flagging that the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the 21 goals, seem to provide a very useful framework for us trying to build these collaborative, coordinated ways of working at catchment level. This may provide a very useful framework because quite a number of the themes do intersect with what was coming up in the NOR vision, like um, life below water, life on land, partnership for the goals, climate action, uh, sustainable communities, clean water and sanitation, and responsible <coughs> consumption and production and good health and well-being. So um, I'd love if, if you want to check out our Facebook page, the NOR vision, give us a like, um, give us a comment, stay in touch with us, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Caroline. That's a very inspiring project, but it takes a lot of effort to get communities together to really share a common vision. So we move on to our final speaker, John Foley, and this is what the individual can do, and, and individual action matters and can make a difference. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for listening to us today. My name is John Foley. Um, I'm a bee farmer from, uh, I suppose a part-time bee farmer from Glencar County, Kerry. Um, I'm one of 40 farmers who have participated in the Kerry Life Pearl, uh, Pearl Mussel Project Scheme. Uh, it's a, it was a pilot scheme uh, which is uh, in its fourth year of a, of a five-year scheme. Um, it has been co-funded by the Nat National Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, this first slide is a picture of Clune Lake, which is the, the beginning of the Cara River, uh, which flows through my farm right down to Cara Lake. Sorry. Uh, this is just where where Glencar is. Uh, Glencar and the and the Blackwater uh, catchment areas. Um, it's a beautiful part of of the country in in South Kerry. Uh, the Cara and Blackwater rivers combined uh, contain about forty six percent of all per, the pearl mussels in Irish rivers. Uh, they are nearing extinction. Uh, because of the conservation threats to the juvenile mussels. And I suppose that's a 
picture of the, the pearl muscle itself. The importance of the, the muscle is that it, each muscle filters approximately 50 litres of water per day. Uh, they are a species with a lifespan of uh, between 35 to 200 years. And they are on the verge of extinction due to the fact of the young mussels not surviving to adulthood. Uh, the main reasons for their not surviving is losses of fine sediment and nutrients from the land uh, on farms, um, smothering the, the pearl mussel habitats. The nature uh, of the mussel, uh, they have to inhale and exhale. So I suppose the main threats to, to the mussel is, um, uh, uh, the main conservation threats is the first one is siltation. And on this slide you see the, the bed of a river where silt is suffocating the mussel. This is devastating again for the juvenile mussel, which is uh, in a juvenile state for about five years. And uh, the second, uh, the conservation threat is the, the nutrients entering the river. And this was nutrients and excess phosphorus entering the river causes the growth of this stringy uh, algae uh, in the river. Again, this algae uh, um, reduces the oxygen levels out of the river. And again, smothering the pearl mussel, uh, reducing the mussel's chances of surviving into adulthood, which again takes five years and uh, I suppose this the, the hydrology changes in the flow of a river um, uh, disrupts the mussel habitat and in, in many cases will destroy uh, the habitat. Uh, land reclamation and drainage uh, reconcurring the river bank changes the flow of the river uh, adding to the siltation problem and disrupting the habitat for the juvenile mussel and the adult mussel as well. So I suppose the the um, the objective of the of the the Kerry Life Pearl Mussel Scheme was to put a, pl a plan in, pa in place, and the main principle uh, of the farm plan, um, but of my plan for the Kerry Life Project was to put measures in place to protect the the, the mussel. Uh, which is a natural resource for keeping uh, the rivers. And I suppose these are some of the measures that I uh, put in place on my own farm. I suppose, um, first of all, that I did, there was 2,800 metres of fencing. Um, uh, all fencing was done at least a metre back from the river banks. And in particular areas, fencing five metres back from the river creating a buffer area, uh, which we, we heard about earlier. Um, this was followed by installing uh, water trucks and nose pumps. And the, depending where the water source was being got from depended on whether a nose pump or a water truck was, was put in a, a particular paddock or fenced up area. Um, so I sectioned the farm into, into the smaller areas. Uh, rotating smaller number of animals in each block. Um, I also protected drains by fencing them, uh, leaving them grow to a grassy uh, state, I suppose, uh, not, not reopening them. Uh, this reduces and slows the, the flow of water going to the rivers. Um, and again, prevent it. the main objective of this is to, to prevent silt going to the river. Uh, I also installed peat plugs uh, in some of the drains, which again uh, slowed the water in the drains entering the river, presenting, preventing silt uh, entering. And uh, silt again is one of the main um, uh, uh, threats for smothering the mussel. Um, so I also, the, over the last couple of years, started changing the herd from uh, a beef, Shirley beef, which is quite a large uh, uh, beef animal. Uh, so I've changed a more traditional breed, which is more suitable to the land area, uh, to 
uh, Hereford and Shartorn. And I suppose I'll continue to do that uh, over the next couple of years as well to bring the whole, uh, all the animals to uh, Hereford and Shartorn breeds. Um, this meant a reduction in the amount of feed they eat because they are a, a smaller animal. Um, I've reduced the number of stock I keep on the farm. Uh, I've started out wintering, which is uh, feeding outside all year round. This has meant that I've no slurry to spread on the farm. And uh, I've, I have also stopped spreading phosphorus uh, based chemicals, uh, chemical fertilizers on the land, thus reducing the nutrients. Uh, all these measures have resulted in, in a reduction of the amount of nutrients and sediment entering the, the fresh water. So, so the, the, the main benefits uh, are the wider benefits uh, of the farm measures to biodiversity and other ecosystems. Uh, the work has had a positive impact on the wider ecology of the river uh, and its catchment. Getting the conditions right for the pearl mussel, uh, which is a, a sensitive species, ensures that the, the conditions for a wide range of other animals are protected and aquatic life such as salmon, trout, liver, lamprey and otters. The farm measures implemented uh, have also resulted in improved condition of wetland, peatland, woodland habitats on the farm and support a wealth of rare plants and animals. Um, and I suppose these intact and functioning habitats also deliver ecosystem services such as clean water, clean air, carbon sequestration and storage and has also, the, the buffer zones and the peat plugs, they, they are all a help to flood alleviation and improve biodiversity. Um, so again, I suppose, I don't have sheep, it's, it's only beef I carry, so it was barbed wire. Other farmers in the plan, um, the Fordrick and Richard, the, 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 the the management team of, uh, in the Pearl Life uh, project would have drawn up, diff they'd have engaged with farmers and uh, I suppose all farmers did different measures. This is a, a peat plug. So again, it's, it's blocking, partly blocking a drain um, and slowing down the flow of water into the river. Uh, just at the end of that, there's a river flowing right there. Um, this is a nose pump. I suppose, again, a nose pump will be installed where, where there isn't um, a, a, a water truck, where a water truck can't be, water can't be fed to a water truck. A nose pump, the animal uh, pushes the, the, the pump and it sucks water from, be it a river or a stream. So you're keeping the animal away from the river and, um, I suppose by keeping the animals from back from the river, uh, there there's less um, poaching of the ground. So thank you very much for listening. Um, it is great to be here. I suppose one of the, one of the main things that that, that came out of this uh, the, the the Kerry Life project was, I suppose the, the Padraig and Richard really did engage with the farmers, um, and I think without proper engagement with the farmers, the, the work is not going to be done. They're not going to understand. As a young fellow, I knew the muscles were there, uh, but I didn't know the importance of them and, and what they do. So thank you very much for listening. Great, thanks very much, John. Uh, it's no small effort, but uh, certainly can make a difference. Uh, I'm conscious that we have lunch at 1.30, so I think we can take about 15 minutes for discussion. Um, I would advise you maybe to use the Slido, but I'm also going to put up a number of questions here that might focus uh, some of the discussions, and I, I suppose I'm Rather than I taking questions, we're actually I'm going to throw the questions to you guys. Uh, so could I first maybe go to the last slide on my presentation, if that's possible? Can we just keep going? Right, there we are. So I have grouped some questions under three headers, and the first is 
I suppose, relates to my own presentation, and that is how do we acquire the knowledge that's going to help us better know what we have and where the threats are and then take action to protect the biodiversity. So what I'm saying here is that we certainly do need checklists and some information on distribution, um, but we can't measure everything. So some options are to select particular indicators that give us a good sense of how things are changing or to try and integrate new DNA methods so that we're able to get a, a genetic signature of the biodiversity in, in our aquatic systems. And then to do the red listing or the conservation assessment at more regular intervals. So my question is, who is going to do this? And can we actually do it? I know we have a, a, um, the water quality monitoring program run by the EPA, so is there any way we can integrate into that biodiversity monitoring? Does anybody care to make some suggestions? Yeah, we can just have the mic here. Um, Maybe I'd ask the panel of the speakers to join me here, please. Thank you. Um, I, I think Marie, um, she out, has outlined what I think is, is the model that we could use for going forward, whereby we could start to identify the gaps and start filling the gaps, but fill it on a sub-catchment or catchment basis. Um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we were saying the big task it was to get all of the information we need. We're now 20 years hence, and we're saying pretty much the same thing, that we still haven't filled all of the gaps. So perhaps if we've put a challenge to ourselves to try and fill all the gaps for at least one river basin district in the country, which could be, is a proportion of the country, we could then start filling the other gaps and be able to monitor what are we losing. When we don't know what we have, we don't know what we're losing. So I think out of today, if there could be a commitment, and it might be picking a number of habitats or subcatchments from different river basin districts, but otherwise, I fear that in 10 years' time, we'll be sitting possibly here saying, we still have gaps. And, you know, we all have to start working together, collaborating, avoiding duplication, but get down to action, I think, mm. in saying, what have we? What is a priority to be filled? And to be honest, start filling it, and then start looking at the trends. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So certainly the priority is to know our biodiversity and where the threats are and how we can best preserve the full complement of that biodiversity. So I suppose, Marie, is there any chance that, that it could be linked into the EPA monitoring program, or how can we do that? Because to this point in time, the information we have has been derived from various research projects that weren't necessarily focused on biodiversity, but that actually generated biodiversity data. Um, I mentioned the blue dot program that's in the River Basin Management Plan is in action. So that could be a vehicle because if you think of the Q5 sites in that, that would be your pristine sites that you could learn from. So that could be that. And also at the moment, the Department of Housing Planning and Local Government are putting in an, a, a life application as well to support potentially the Blue Dots program as well. So that could be a start, a place okay. to... So what you're suggesting is that maybe for the blue dot catchments that we have more biodiversity assessments because I know the Q value is based largely at family level identification so it doesn't really capture biodiversity. So it's yeah. to go that step further. And I know we have some people here from the Law Pro offices and maybe they would like to make a comment on that. Is that something that could be achieved in some of those catchments? Otherwise, as the last speaker said over there, uh, we will be in the same position in 10 years' time. I will be outlining the same knowledge gaps. Yeah, somebody there. Uh, on the subject of, ooh, that's much louder than I thought. On the subject of addressing the knowledge gaps, um, one of the things that's worked quite well for other forms of biodiversity research is citizen science. 
And I know there are obviously gaps that aren't useful for that, particularly like invertebrate species tend not to be super popular with citizen science programs. But in terms of monitoring specific issues along rivers, because there's been some really good community work that obviously in the Norvision um, and the Kerry Life program show getting local people involved in monitoring their own areas. One of the things that's worked quite well is the National Biodiversity Data Center's app and their mm. online monitoring system. And they have specific drives for specific forms of species at various times. The invasive species program that the alien invasive species program that ran, I think last year, um, found very specific data that was able to do good mapping um, and is a relatively fast and inexpensive way to fill some knowledge gaps. Though it is, it only applies to certain issues that are more visible to the untrained eye, but it certainly is a a method. Yeah, I think citizen science can play a big role and there has been very good success in the pollinator monitoring. Uh, so it'll probably just take a little bit of effort to try and mod modify some of the schemes that they're appropriate for citizen science and they actually reflect changes in biodiversity. I think we had another question here. Go ahead. Sorry, I just put in on that, um, that the EPA have funded a project within the Biodiversity Data Centre, so we are intending on rolling out a citizen science survey for dragonflies and damselflies starting this year, so watch this space. Okay, very good. That's just another question over here. Uh, just, on a, hello. just on a point of information, um, Kevin Lyon, the EPA Analytics Unit here, uh, we are starting to work with the Ordnance Survey to deliver a high resolution national land cover map, which will hopefully uh, address the knowledge gap in terms of land use and land cover in catchments and across the country, um, working to uh, deliver this within the next two years. So hopefully that will be a, a large source of information um, that can be fed into models such as this. Okay, thank you. Uh, just one more and then I'll move on to awareness. Or I might be jumping ahead actually because I was going to move away from the hard science and actually ask about engagement. May I just ask if, uh, kind of go off piece and ask my own question to the panel? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, so Sinead O'Brien from the Sustainable Water Network. Um, it's about measures and community action. I was really interested in John's presentation on the work he had done on his farm. And we heard a few things this morning about how landowners have to be incentivized to do things and they'll only do it if it doesn't hit their pocket um, and I'm just wondering as uh, Caroline your experience as well of your project do do is that true because I'm wondering is that a bit unfair on farmers I mean if you know when you learned about the French water pearl mussel I mean is it all about getting the money for it or did that cost, cost you money yourself or you know is it true that somebody will only do something if they get money thanks I, yeah I suppose it, it it's a fair question and I was asked this morning uh, and I was asked yesterday as well um, would, uh, if there was no uh, increment or payment, uh, would I have got involved? And I suppose uh, an honest answer is, is no. Uh, but at, at that stage, I didn't know the value of the pearl mussel, I suppose. And it was with Podrick and Richard and, and the team engaging with the farmers. And this was, I love this, I've said it a few times, the first time Podrick came on the farm, and I said to him, is there much point I doing this here if that farmer isn't doing it and this farmer here isn't doing it? And part of the answer to that was, we have to start somewhere. Uh, so I suppose that the, the, the Kerry Life project has, it has, um, it has started. And there is, uh, the Department of Agriculture are rolling out another scheme uh, which will in, incorporate uh, six other catchment areas so they, they are they are looking at continuing it um, measures were only uh, our payment was only paid when measures were completed so if you didn't do any work there was no payment for it so but again the honest answer would probably have to be, uh, if, if there was no payment, would farmers get involved? Yes, you'd have a few, but you certainly wouldn't have all. And I think you, going forward, you, you, in some shape or form, all farmers will have to be involved. And um, 
In terms of the Norvision, we had uh, conventional farmers take part in our workshops, as well as organic farmers. Um, and it was really interesting to hear from them. Obviously, they were in the workshops. They were particularly engaged um, representatives from their communities. But organic farmers were telling us about how floodwaters are affecting their, their, their produce and their ability to sell them as organic when their land is flooded. And they, they have a real concern about flooding and a lack of maintenance of, of rivers and removal of debris. And then conventional farmers you know, the, the, the kind of farming, and farming is, is, is a spectrum. There, there is no farmer in Ireland. The kind of farming and the place where John is, is farming in the west of Ireland, it's, it's a real struggle to farm there. But you farm because it's your ancestral heritage and, and, and you continue on there. And it's, and it's a beautiful landscape and it's, it's a really good job to have. But it doesn't make money in the current model of industrialized agriculture that we have in Ireland and in Europe incentivized by the common agricultural policy. So a lot of farmers like John are part-time. They do their farming, but they actually don't make an income from it. If you look at the economics of it, as Chagas have done annually in their National Farm Survey, the economics are frightening for the majority of farmers, and that's why they or their spouse have an off-farm job. Um, so the reality is, if you want to if, if you want to um, make those kind of changes at farm level, right down on the ground, that will make a difference. We are going back to what Jane Stout was talking about in this morning's plenary, about just transitions. And it, it is appropriate for us to subsidise farmers. Farmers are being subsidised, but they're being subsidised in a way and in a model of, of agricultural policy that is very much uh, towards industrial agriculture. So... Our politicians in Brussels and nationally have an opportunity to change that model that farmers are working to. They have to work to that model to get their, their subsidies. Most of their income comes from it unless they're intelligent and daring. So beef and, and sheep farmers, they have to work to this model. Whatever they think about it personally, it is the model that is going to bring home the bacon for them. So it's a political question about changing how we design agricultural schemes, going back to that idea of multiple benefits, we have an opportunity, we have really good models of agri-environmental schemes like the Rural Environment Protection Scheme in the past, not so much the GLASS now, I've heard more criticism of GLASS, but we have schemes like that and the WALK scheme. So we have farmers that are able to be subsidised for you know, being more environmentally friendly in their farming practices and having traditional breeds and so on and so forth, as well as farmers who allow access on their land. So there are ways that we can bring those two together and we can put more money from CAP into those programs. But right now, the CAP is still very much dominated with industrial agriculture. And I, I think that's what it goes back to. Um, and the last thing I would say about, I, I agree, um, Sinead, uh, that it is unfair to farmers because even though John is saying he gets paid for it and that was an incentive for him to join up, I can guarantee you that the work that John is doing is, goes far beyond what he's paid for. And the, how I learned this was I'm from West Cork where farmers tend to have very uh, marginal land in my part in Peninsular West Cork and I'm working on this Norvision project in a much stronger agricultural area. And I know the farmers who are being subsidised for the walk scheme in West Cork and they're doing it and that's grand. But when I went to Kilkenny and I met farmers that were subsidised under the walk scheme, because in Kilkenny they hire labour and they know exactly how much labour costs to do the work they're expected to do for the walk scheme versus the West Cork farmer who does it any time of day for any number of hours, the Kilkenny farmer was saying, we're not being paid enough because my labourer can't do what's expected and be paid a, a basic living wage. So maybe we, we will leave that and just move on because I'm going to try and finish within five minutes. Um, just on the issue, first of, before we address these two questions here, on the issue of awareness, is there enough awareness and are we doing enough to generate awareness? So is there anybody from the Law Pro offices that could maybe comment on that? I see Steve there and he's going to hate me for this, but anyway. <laughs> Sorry, so Stephen Day is the local authority water program. Um, so as part of the program, actually, for the, the 190 areas for action we have throughout the country, um, the first thing we have to do for all of these is hold uh, community information meetings. Um, so as we've been doing before, doing any field work in these areas, um, and they've been very useful so far um, in terms of um, engaging the communities with us. And one really positive aspect, actually, is that every meeting we've had so far, 
Um, we've had people come back to us and ask us um, to come back to them with updates on, on what's happening within the catchment. Um, and particularly the, the farming community has really come out in force for these as well. Um, and it's great to see the engagement from them. Um, so in terms of engagement though, I think um, for a lot of them, there was an awful lot of fear around the programme at the start. Um, we're finally starting to get that word out kind of now. Um, but I think an awful lot more needs to be done kind of in terms of engaging communities. Um, it's great to see things like the Norvision here today and from, from John as well for the, the farming community. Um, but I think an awful lot more does need to be done um, in terms of engaging the community on biodiversity. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Steve. I just want to take the three questions that are here. Uh, there's one there. How can we promote strategic native woodland creation uh, to protect water alongside other benefits of woodland biodiversity, etc.? And that's coming from um, Daphne, Kevin. Um, Declan, would you like to make a few comments there? First of all, just in it, action was the last part of your, your, <coughs> your mm. tree there in the last slide. And I think um, from my experience of working with uh, native woodlands and, and um, the technical side of it and rolling out measures and so on, the difficulty with freshwater catchments, of course, is that a shotgun approach isn't going to work. So if you get one farmer doing it or one landowner doing it and another not and so on, you're not going to meet your target. <coughs> so my belief is that actually a cart and stick approach is, is required here in the, in the next round of, of, of cap reform that measures are actually mandatory. They're paid for, but they're mandatory, and that we use the awareness uh, projects like Kerry Life and Native Woodland Scheme and so on to achieve these. But unless they're mandatory, I think we're wasting our time. Mm. So that's the first thing. In terms of, of Native Woodland Scheme, well, with Native Woodland Scheme, there are um, uh, various different um, um, uh, measures, in, a suite of measures within the scheme itself, and one of them is, is towards uh, protecting water quality and enhancing uh, in-stream biodiversity. And we have found that it is difficult in terms of uptake because of this, uh, you know, that it encroaches on, say, in marginal areas in particular, uh, on some of the better quality land that farmers have. So again, I think it's, it's down to a trade-off between um, the incentives that are there to, to manage and to expand those, those buffer areas and to um, uh, as, uh, make it more mainstream within, rather than it just being a forestry scheme uh, as part of a forestry uh, suite of measures, that is part of the, as I say, single farm payments and, and, and um, um, uh, rural development program from, from the next round. So that will be going in from our submission into, into the department okay. uh, in, in for the next round of, of cap reform. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a question there, Marie, for you. I don't know whether you want to take that. Is there oversight and, uh, and monitoring of ASAP recommendations? Uh, in terms of... Uh, ASAP in terms of the recommendations is it mm. for the actual measures that are ongoing on on the farms themselves? Sorry, who, who Sorry. posed yeah. the question? Yeah, once, once you've identified your sources and recommendations then are made, uh, how are they then monitored? over time, or is the monitoring, is it built into the program? Yeah, the, um, okay, so once the, the, so at a national scale at the moment, like I showed, we've identified for agriculture, the water bodies, that agriculture is the significant pressure. So what LOCRO will first be going out and undertaking catchment walks along those streams, and that will identify the exact locations along those streams that are impacted by certain pressures. And then where agriculture is deemed to be a significant pressure along those uh, stream or river stretches, then that will be passed on to ASAP. And ASAP will then go and liaise with the, the farmers in that area to work with them to implement appropriate actions, change behavior, put in hard measures. Um, so at the moment, this work is just beginning. So there's no oversight of any recommendations at the moment. We're just, the catchment walks are literally, they've only began, I think, <coughs> since December. So, but going forward, what, uh, what will happen is that ASAP will collate all their information and then they will report that back uh, into, um, uh, our, we have a system in the EPA at a water body scale. They won't be identifying the exact measure or identifying farmers' names or anything like that, but they'll be just identifying the measures that were needed at a water body scale. 
to tackle the issues. So that will be where we get back the information and we see what measures are being used. And, and in terms of the monitoring, well, the monitoring will have to tie in with the existing monitoring program. So when we see an improvement in our trends or in our uh, status that I showed in my presentation, that will indicate if that measure is working. Now, Law Pro may uh, decide that they want to do some individual spot monitoring along channels as well to kind of get an earlier indication because sometimes there's lags in terms of response in, you know, of biology. So they may want to target just individual, um, you know, to see if phosphorus uh, trends are decreasing. But that hasn't been worked through yet because the process is just beginning. So we're just at the start of the journey, really, at the moment in terms of that. Maria, I wonder would you be able to answer that or at least comment on that question as to what efforts are being made to influence national agricultural policy towards less damaging enterprises? Uh, well, I suppose we the capital reform is coming up, so it will be a, a consultation, a, a, con a consultative process as part of that. So mm -hmm. obviously we'll be feeding into that and water quality from our perspective will be uh, a big, uh, will be the, the key focus for us. Um, I suppose even in an article uh, yesterday, you know, also, you know, the derogation review is coming up uh, under the uh, Nitrates Action Plan as well. And even yesterday in the Irish Independent, uh, Jack Nolan was, um, uh, uh, was quoted as saying uh, at a recent presentation that, you know, things do need to change in terms of, you know, how farmers apply their fertilizer and how they manage their fertilizer and nutrient application at a farm scale. Mm -hmm. Now, what will come out of that still, there are the opportunities for us to feed into that review as well. So there's an opportunity. Yeah, opportunity. yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, it's, it's lunchtime, so I think I close the session by thanking our three speakers. There's certainly the projects, the Norvision and the Carry Life give me some, I suppose, hope that things may change slowly, but in the right direction. Thank you.